traditionally public health has worked as this top-down approach where you say it from the ivory tower and then all of a sudden, you know, people change and make, you know, the evidence-based decision. And that's just not how the world is right now. Hello, hello, and welcome to The Conversation. I'm Dasha Burns, Politico's White House Bureau Chief, and every week on this show, I invite one of the most compelling and sometimes unexpected power players in Washington and beyond in for a chat to find out how they're navigating and shaping this incredible era of American politics. And this week, our conversation comes from beyond D.C. I got to chat with Dr. Caitlin Jetalina. She's the public health expert behind the Substack, your local epidemiologist. And we talk about how some of the issues around COVID-19 led to this current moment of skepticism in the health system and the changing and sometimes confusing policy. According to Dr. Jetalina, we're on the verge of system collapse. Here's my conversation with Dr. Caitlin Jetalina. Caitlin Jetalina, thank you so much for joining the conversation. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. So we learned just before we started recording that we uh, share the same hometown, or at least where you live now is where where I grew up um, in San Diego in Oceanside, the best part of San Diego, in my humble opinion. It is. It is like going to be 70 degrees today, and I'm loving it. No, it's the best place. Palm trees, no leaves turning, totally different vibes than where I am uh, in Washington, D.C. right now. But let's talk about your work. You are a scientist and an academic. You have a Ph.D. in epidemiology, but you're also the creator of this pretty popular, widely read newsletter, Your Local Epidemiologist. When you were nerding out working towards your Ph.D., did do you think that this is what you'd end up doing? Absolutely not. I look back at the last five, six years. It's been an insane journey. Um, incredibly organic, was never planned uh, and was needed, though. Um, and I really stumbled upon this need and tried to fill the gap as quickly and as uh, swiftly as I could and, uh, you know, find ourselves in a very different but maybe even so, the kind of similar space than we were six years ago and trying to to meet the need and empower as many people as I can as quickly as we can. Yeah, so people that don't follow you, can you explain what your local epidemiologist is, how it got started. So it started back in March of 2020. I don't know if I have to explain to everyone what happened in March of 2020, but I'm an epidemiologist, right? And I was at the front line of the COVID-19 response in the state of Texas and started really seeing this need um, that was beyond, you know, the frontline policy, but more in so answering questions, concerns, and confusion from a place of empathy, from somewhere that was very understandable, that was timely, and that was actionable. And it started as an email to actually my staff, faculty, and students. I was at an academic institution at the time. And then a few days later, one of my students came to me and she's like, Dr. Jetalina, can you please just put this on social media so I don't have to keep copying and pasting it for my family and friends? And I distinctly remember telling my husband, like, what the hell? I only have to do this for like six weeks max. And then surely someone's going to pick up the baton and actually explain what the heck is going on. And that never happened. And, you know, it grew and grew and grew. And now it's this public health newsletter. It translates what is happening in public health and most importantly, tries to empower people to make evidence-informed decisions for themselves, their family, and their community. Shifting a bit to politics, this is Politico, after all. If you go back like 10 years or so, um, public health like was not a hot topic in the news all of the time. Since the pandemic, and now especially with the rise of, of RFK Jr. as HHS secretary and the MAHA movement, there are constant headlines talking about these issues. What to you are sort of the defining elements of public health in this moment? What do you think is good and working and and what's the stuff that makes you a little uncomfortable? Yeah, you know, I, I, I tell my colleagues that like public health basically didn't exist to the general public before 2020. And that's when it was introduced. And there's good things and bad things about that, right? I mean, we have decades and decades of work. We're considered the invisible shield. And that means if we're doing our jobs, you don't really know it um, because you're not really dying from diseases and you don't have to go to the dentist for fluoride use, et cetera. Right now, we see ourselves 
at a perfect storm between a lot of things. One, on the heels of the COVID pandemic, a lot of people have mistrust and a lot of questions and a lot of frustration over the past. I think we also see ourselves with a drastically changing information landscape that people are no longer getting their information just from the news. We have social media. Um, and I think that we've also had this rise in this curiosity-driven class, and people have questions, and I think rightfully so. How public health turns into that or um, intersects with that is the billion-dollar question right now. Yeah. I think that we're moving as a culture into more of an individualized world than a collective good. And that's a huge challenge in public health when we try to treat populations rather than treating individuals. With a lot of the budget cuts, oh, there's a, been many important conversations on what is public health value to a society and what do we keep? And most importantly, what I get excited is, is what do we reimagine to better meet the needs of Americans and where they are at? today, not where we wish they were. The systems we have today were built for another time, and public health hasn't adapted, hasn't listened, and it's it's totally time to start reimagining um, our impact and how we empower others out there. Looking back for a moment, because you, you hit on a number of things uh, about skepticism of the individual, right? And um, when you were talking about COVID, um, the lack of experts telling people transparently what we do and we don't know very clearly, right? Do you think the sort of traditional public health experts, public health systems bear any responsibility for the erosion of public trust that we've seen over the last several years? I think some of it, for sure. You know, traditionally, public health has worked as this top-down approach where you say it from the ivory tower and then all of a sudden, you know, people change and make, you know, the evidence-based decision. And that's just not how the world is right now. I think there's a much bigger need right now to meet people where they're at. Um, you know, us as scientists are never trained in how to communicate our science. And so bringing science to society and society to science is something that we needed to do 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and really never um, stepped up to do that. And I would even say today, there's a whole lot of resistance to changing that model in the first place. And, and I think that's where I see it a bit differently than a lot of my colleagues on what mm -hmm. is needed in this moment. There is a lot of reimagining happening right now with with RFK Jr. <laughs> at HHS. Um, I want to talk a little bit about that. I mean, one of the most recent announcements that I know a lot of my friends who are pregnant are now confused and concerned about this issue of Tylenol. What are you hearing from pregnant women and providers and, and how impactful was this announcement? What, what does it kind of mean from here? I've never seen such a harmful press conference, I think, in my life. The amount of uh, falsehoods um, were coming out like a fire hose. And just to clarify, we're talking about President Trump and RFK Jr.'s announcement about Tylenol and recommending that pregnant women do not take Tylenol unless they have a high fever or in a case of emergency. Right. And their reason was because they think the evidence shows that it leads to autism. So, you know, I was watching that and I could just see the falsehood spewing out, like I said, like a fire hose, right? With a few kernels of truth mixed in there. But as a, I'm a mom, right? I have a five and six year old. And to me and my friends, I mean, the aftermath was visceral. My text lit up with a lot of worry, right? Even the faint suggestion of blame haunts pregnant yeah. women and parents, right? And we're already cr like caring so much as moms in this this country already. And so I think being told to toughen up um, without regard to the confusion, the doubt, and the guilt that are placed on us um, far too often these days is really what I took out of that. They also made this really grave mistake that they are underestimating the power of parents, right? Parents don't need fear-mongering or false certainty. They want and deserve accurate information with context and respect. The reimagining piece, though, what's the Venn diagram of, yeah, let's shake up how we do things when it comes to government and healthcare and health policy and try new things 
versus doing harm. I definitely believe in the need for radical transformation and rethinking of our systems. You could argue that that's what is happening right now. I think the big difference, though, is that when we do radical transformation, it's grounded in American principles born from imagination, innovation, and hope. All I see right now is extreme wreckage and destruction and short-term gain at the expense of long-term health. And so, I mean, what I would like to see, and I think it's a future we all deserve, is empowering people with the tools they need to stay healthy. I think it means strengthening systems that shape health, like clean air and clean water. I think it means integration of services for accessibility instead of fragmentation or disinvestment. I think it's being transparent like letting scientists speak freely. That's not happening right now. Um, I think it's fact fact grounded, right? Data grounded and lived experiences is also what we're seeing. And I think it means an accountable health ecosystem that uh, with both efficiency and effectiveness, I think our leaders need to hear that this is the future we want and we expect them to build. When you say, what are we doing right now? Like, what are you referring to? Just like this complete destruction um, you know, I was an advisor to three CDC directors and um, I was actually brought in to try to reimagine and I was told to f- ruffle the feathers, right? To Because it needs to happen. I don't think you had any idea just how, how ruffled how much feathers I could have get. Yeah, yeah I guess I should have um, been more. But like, I think that right now, one in three CDC employees have been fired over the past three months. And there's a way to do that that has a vision and has a strategy. And I just haven't seen that right yet. I mean, I've only seen complete destruction um, because some people want public health to feel pain right now. And um, I think that comes, it's completely disregarding what what Americans really need. And it puts us in a very vulnerable place of America um, for health and security. I mean, what do you think will be the impact long term of these mass layoffs that we're seeing at the CDC? I think it's a really good question and something that we all have to be asking ourselves. I mean, I my short term concern is I think we are very close, not there yet, but very close to system collapse. There's a reason why we have a CDC and it's for disease response. It's for biosecurity. It's for us to stitch together all of the data that's happening. And um I don't know what it looks like. I think that, you know, being vulnerable is the perfect place for a bug to come in and wreak havoc. And it could be prevented. And it's really it's really hard for um, it's really hard for me to watch. So California, Oregon and Washington recently announced a West Coast Health Alliance as a sort of regional counter to the cutbacks at the CDC and changes at the national level. How do you think those kinds of efforts might work? Like, do you think it's going to be helpful or does it just create kind of a more confusing patchwork system? I think it's helpful. Like, I think it's very clear that there's huge gaps that need to be filled outside of federal government right now. And I do see a lot of people stepping up to the plate. I think the question is the coordination and collaboration between all of these. I think it's um, how do we make this incredibly quick changing landscape as clear as possible for the Americans who need it. And how do we like, yeah, fill these gaps temporarily with a general understanding that there's a reason why we have a federal government. I'm very quite concerned about, for example, a lot of my friends in the red states right now who aren't part of a lot of these coalitions and what the possible impact will have on their health, but also the health of others. Diseases don't see borders. And we need to figure out how to work together and how to get this fleet moving in the same direction um, while, while filling a lot of those gaps. Yeah, diseases don't see borders. Diseases also don't see politics. And so what happens? How are individuals going to be impacted and have to navigate if you've got, you know, these certain states, these coalitions saying one thing and then the federal government giving different guidance that may contradict the former guidance? Like how 
are people supposed to navigate this? It's so confusing. It's confusing for me. And like, this is like, and you're an expert. What I'm supposed <laughs> yeah. to be doing. Right. And yeah. like, so I have really deep empathy for um, other moms, other parents, other individuals out there just trying to understand what the heck is going on, who they can trust, and most importantly, if they're supposed to do something or not to protect themselves. There's a lot of themes that I'm seeing pop up right now that I saw pop up five, six years ago of why I really started this in the first place. And I think that one goal that I've had over this past couple months is to lay out what all those pieces are, what 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 evidence to weigh, how someone's weighing it against other evidence and why, and really try to equip people in this incredibly confusing and chaotic moment. Yeah. Uh, thinking about how you're personally playing your role here, like what are the stories that you think will be dominating the conversation in in the coming months ahead in, in this public health space and how are you going to navigate and influence that right I, I mean I think right now what is very clear is that you know data people don't need more data and facts they need narrators they need storytellers and they need navigators one piece of what I try to bring like I said is authenticity that I'm a human writing this epi newsletter that was never supposed to be here, but I really wanted to walk people through this. I mean, a great example is the Tylenol during pregnancy and autism thing. And my newsletter that week was explaining to people what the what evidence the administration was looking at, what evidence the other experts and pregnancy people are looking at, and to walk people through the risk and benefit and trade-offs that we all have to take. You know, I think the other really important thing is, especially around vaccines, is we are at a moment where there's just really general amnesia uh, because we've never seen like measles or polio or um, whooping cough. And we really need storytellers out there. I think one great movement that's happening right now is this grassroots movement of grandparents. I just love them. They call themselves the grandparents for vaccines that are sharing a lot of stories around what they saw when they were young, why they lined up for vaccines and why they're fighting for it and continue to fight for it for their kids. This is going to be a team effort. I think every single person has an, a role to play and um I don't know. I'm just honored to be a part of the team and and see where we go next. Well, Dr. Caitlin Jetalina, thank you so much for coming on to dig through all of this as uh, we try to understand what what is happening uh, with all this information out there. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. This has been The Conversation with Dasha Burns. We'll be back next week. If you want to catch future episodes of The Conversation, make sure to hit that subscribe button below. Thanks for watching.